Good morning, and thanks for joining us here at Cascade Church Online. Uh, We're excited to be with you all today and just have a couple announcements for you to keep in mind. First off, this Sunday we're starting a new series called Reconnect, and in light of that, we're also offering a membership class. For those of you who haven't had a chance to become a member here at Cascade, but may have been attending for some time or even a little time, but have chosen to call Cascade your home and your church family, then this may be for you. Uh, and so if you are interested in that, we're going to have some in-person, an in-person membership class on March 14th and the 21st during the 11 a.m. service. And also we'll have an online option this time on March 28th, also at 11 a.m. Uh, Today, we are going to be doing communion during the service, so if you have elements around your house that you would like to get before uh, before we jump into things, that way you're ready to go, then I'd encourage you to do that. And now, let's join each other in worship. Come, let us worship our King. Oh, come, let us bow at His feet. Done great things. I see what the Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Yes, he has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every cat. Your name is 
easy to lose sight that you preside in the mundane. How quickly we forget the power that's running through our veins. The kind of power that empties grace. And oh my soul, remember who you're talking to. The only one who death bows to.
Hello, good morning, and welcome back to the family. So good to be together with you again. Uh, my name is Michael Lodge. I'm the speaking pastor here at Cascade Community Church, uh, and I am so excited to continue to connect with you uh, in this way. Uh, and uh, we are starting a new series today. Uh, we just wrapped up Ephesians, which was amazing, and just hearing the call that God has placed on our lives to be a light in this dark world, to be a city that is transformed by the love of Jesus that can show the world what it looks like to fall in love with Jesus and be used by him. Uh, today, we're starting a new series that, that builds on that, and we're calling it Reconnect. And I feel this deep inside, like for so many reasons, uh, for everything that we've gone through in this last year, after a year of, of isolation, of being disconnected, of trying to, to figure out how we're supposed to, to live our lives, it, it's time for us to reconnect on so many different levels. Uh, for us to creatively find ways for you to continue to connect and reconnect with the church and with the people of the church, and for you to, to, to see what the vision is at Cascade. Uh, one of the things we've found that is we've gone through not only this, this hard year with COVID, but also a hard year with transition, with me stepping into this new role, and what it means for us to be Cascade Community Church. Uh, so it's not just a time for us to reconnect with each other, but it's a time for us to reconnect with love God, love people, and live generously. While we have been stepping back and trying to figure out life, like you're, you're not the only ones trying to figure out what it means to work in new ways and to be a family in new ways. And even us at the church, as we think through who we are and what L3 means, we've, we've had to go back to the drawing board. We've had to go back and try to talk to our ministries. How do we continue to live out our ministry in new ways? And one of the things that have, has been really beneficial for us to be going through this really creative season in life uh, is for us as, as leadership to reconnect with L3. And, and understand what it really means and, and a deeper understanding, an understanding that helps you, the church member, you, the person who has joined Cascade, learn how to L3 in a different way. We, we know it means love God, love people, live generously. But what we're going to find today as we set the series up for the next two months we're going to be looking at love God, love people, live generously, but we're going to add two words to that that I really think is going to change everything. It's going to deepen your understanding of what it means to love God, love people, and live generously, and it's going to help you learn how it plays out in your life a little more. Uh, so one of the things that we thought of is we thought around these two words. Uh, John Reynolds actually came up with this, this phrase uh, that, that we are made on purpose for a purpose. So let, let that sink in. What, what do you hear when you hear that? What does what your heart feel when you hear that? We are made on purpose for a purpose. And we're going to explore those two phrases and, and see what Jesus does in the midst of that. Uh, but when I was thinking about it, I thought about this tool that I have up on the screen, which you probably can't see too well. It looks like a, a little medieval micro pizza cutter, okay? Just this little tiny thing. And when you see that, when you see that picture, you're probably thinking, what in the world is that? And it, it could almost look accidental, like some little two-year-old just threw a bunch of random Lego things together and formed this really weird thing. But this tool was actually made on purpose for a purpose. Uh, this, this is a little leather working tool, and, and it was made to be in the hands of a leather worker. It wasn't, mean, it wasn't made to, to be in the hands of an auto mechanic or, or a, a pilot of an airplane. Like It was made to be in the hands of a master leather crafter. That's the purpose to which it belongs. And, and it was made for a purpose, to be used by the leather worker to, to carve out lines in the leather and to set a path. Like There's a specific purpose that this tool plays. You know, so as we think about that, like I, I want us to kind of feel that, that we are made for a purpose. We are made on purpose. We are made for a purpose. We just came out of Ephesians, and in, in chapter 2, verse 10, there's a, there's a verse that I encourage you to memorize that says that we are God's workmanship. We are God's workmanship created 
in Christ. We are created on purpose. We are created in Christ for a purpose. We are created for good works, which God prepared before time began so that we may walk in them. So we are made on purpose for a purpose. We are his workmanship. We are made to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, and we are made for a purpose through Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to look at today when we open up and explore these two phrases. The first of this is this, we are made on purpose. You read Psalm 139, and and it is a beautiful psalm that proves this point, that from the beginning of time, when every one of us were made, we were made on purpose. We weren't random. We weren't an accident. We were made on purpose. Psalm 139 says says that God knit us together in our mother's womb, that from the very beginning, God had a plan. God had a purpose something for us to step into. We were created for a reason. And that reason, we would say, is to find abundant life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is why every single one of us were created. From the beginning of time, look at Adam and Eve, and all the way moving forward from that, the reason why God made humans, why God made us and set us up differently from the rest of the world, was on purpose for us to have abundant life in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So the first thing as we unpack this that I want to see is I feel like we have to kind of reclaim uh, that, that word abundant. Because so let me let me read where we get that in John 10.10. 10, it says this, Therefore the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may. So if one of his disciples asked Jesus, why did you come? This is how he would have answered it. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now notice what Jesus didn't say here. He didn't say, I have come that they may have money and have money abundantly. I know a lot of people read that and there's a movement, you know, in in one of our uh, splinter groups of Christianity that gives the prosperity gospel and it's all built around our material wealth. And, And they would say that we've come to have an abundant life, but Jesus didn't say that we have come, that he came to give us money so that we may have money abundantly. I mean, that, that makes no sense when you read about Jesus because you don't see him riding on the most expensive camel into Bethany or into Bethlehem or traveling around from Jerusalem. He, he didn't have the most expensive stuff. He wasn't layered in materialistic wealth. You look at the disciples and they didn't model a wealthy lifestyle because that's not what Jesus was talking about here. He said, I have come that they may have life and have life abundantly. So when the disciples would look to him and and ask, why did you come? Jesus would say, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If you're hungry, come to me and eat. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the only way into the Father. I'm the way for you to have eternal life and abundant life now. So the abundant life is defined by Jesus's life. As the disciples would watch Jesus, he led an example. He led a life for them to see this is what the fullest expression of human life is supposed to look like. Think about it like this. Jesus was fully God and fully man. And and in his humanity, he lived the only perfect human life. So when we look to him, we, we, we don't only see how we're called to live, but we see the definition of what an abundant life is supposed to look like. He lived the fullest human life possible, and he calls us to do the same thing, to find our abundant life in a relationship with him. Jesus would say, as, as he was, was asked, if you turn over to, to Matthew chapter 22, when, when he was asked about eternal life and life now and, and what's the most important commandment, how did Jesus answer that? He said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. That is the greatest commandment. Jesus said, if you're looking for abundant life, if you want to have eternal life then and abundant life now, it has to start with a relationship with God, the right kind of relationship 
with God, a love relationship with God when, when you are living and you are loving him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. So the disciples would look to Jesus and, and, and look to him to define what it looks like to love God. And here's the question that we have to ask. Do we love God like Jesus loved God? As we hear him define this, it's easy for us to read this and to think about a lot of things, but, but, but let's hold our attention to, to, to these two words. Do we love God like Jesus loved God? So, so here's, here's the thing that, that, that we want to see. Like if you look at one of Jesus' disciples, Peter, the, the disciples, their job, what made them disciples was to look at their rabbi, to look at Jesus and say, I want to model all of my life after you. I want to live my life. I want to walk the way you walk. I want to love God the way you love God. I want to live life the way you live life. They, they would look to Jesus and listen to Peter's words as he expresses that. This is what he says in, in 2 Peter. For to this you've been called, because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. So let me read that again. Because Christ also suffered for you. And what that means, if you, if you think about the illustration from last week, that the egg analogy and how fragile that egg was. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus, even though he existed in equality with God, did not consider equality something to be taken advantage of. So he emptied himself out, taking on the form of a servant, taking on the form of a human. Jesus came and lived his life on earth. Even though he existed in the fullness of God, he took on the form of a fragile egg. He took on the form of a human, and he lived his life in that way to show us, to give us an example. He suffered in that way so that we could learn how we are to live our lives. He set us an example so that we may walk in that example. So when we ask him, Jesus, how did you love God? How did you love your father? Because that's how I want to follow in that example and to love God in that same way. I want to come and see who God is. Jesus, I want to follow you, and, and I want my heart to connect with God the same way your heart connected to God. And I want my heart to change, to look like your heart because of that love relationship with you. I want the love I have for you to change my heart to look like Jesus. Do you love God like Jesus? We got a lot of really cool things out of the 90s. Um, I'm, I, that's when I was really loving life. I hated the 80s, and I got bored with culture in the, in the 2000s and beyond. The 90s were prime. I loved the 90s. I'm a little biased, okay? We got a lot of really cool things from the 90s. And one of them that you may recognize, around the time that I was graduating, uh, there was this new trend, this new fad that was coming through uh, Christianity. It was the WWJD bracelets. How many of you had a bracelet or a necklace or a t-shirt or a bumper sticker that said WWJD? What would Jesus do? Now, I'm going to share a little bit about where that came from. Uh, it was around 97 when a pastor in Topeka, Kansas, was doing a Bible study and he was preparing for a sermon. His name was, was Charles Sheldon. So, so Charles was, was sitting at home. And he was preparing his lesson. He had a busy day at work. He had to get away, get home. He couldn't get a sermon done there. He came, to, he came home so that he could work on it in, in the privacy of his home. And he was working on, on actually this verse, on 2 Peter chapter 2. And he was, he was reading and he was studying and he was taking in the word and he was asking, God, what did your suffering mean? What was this example that you left for us? How are we supposed to follow in your footsteps? And, and things started to fall in line and he was starting to get sermon illustrations and he was just getting excited about breaking the sermon down in so many different ways. I can totally relate to that. Uh, then all of a sudden, while he's sitting there studying, there's this knock on his door. And he just gets frustrated immediately that, that his sermon has been interrupted again. And he kind of peeks out his window downstairs and he sees this, this man that's kind of dressed in, in, in filthy rags. He, he looks homeless and he's just, I, I don't have time to go downstairs and answer that. So he goes back into his sermon development and, and again, the door he heard 
was knocking, someone was knocking at the door, and he, and he finally goes downstairs, he opens up the door, and, and this man that has just recently lost a job, he's been living on the streets, came to his door, knocked on it and said, I, I, I hear that you're really well connected in the community and, and I'm looking for a job. If you can help me get connected with the railroad, uh, finding a job with them, like can, can you help me in any way? And, and Sheldon looked at him and said, I, 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 I don't know of any job openings. I don't know how I can help you. I really don't have any resources for you and I'm really busy right now and I don't have time for you. So he closed the door and the man continued to knock and, and Sheldon just kind of walked away, went back upstairs and got to what he thought was his purpose. I need to finish this sermon. His wife was down the road and, and came home later uh, from watching the kids at a playground and was talking to Sheldon and said uh, to, to her husband that, that this homeless man came and sat at the playground and kind of like shook everyone up and everyone was a little nervous because this, this dirty man was hanging around the children. Uh, and and it, a light kind of went off in his head that it was the same guy that was knocking on his door. And he kind of shrugged it off and he went on to, to brag about his sermon to his wife. Uh, so the next day when they woke up, went to church, he was ready to preach the sermon. He was ready to share about the suffering of Christ and the example that he left for us to live and how we are supposed to step in his steps and follow his example. And in the middle of a worship song, they were singing about this exact same thing. The songs aligned perfectly, and, and, and they were singing about living their lives for Jesus. And he, he gets up afterwards to preach. And in that moment, while he's standing in front of the entire congregation, his heart breaks because he realized that he was about to preach hypocrisy. He was about to preach something that he himself wasn't living out. There was something wrong with the way he was loving God. For him to be able to interact with the Word of God, for him to be able to prepare a sermon, he wasn't loving God like Jesus. He wasn't connecting with God. He wasn't following in Jesus' example. His heart wasn't changing to be like Christ. And he realized in that moment that he couldn't preach a word. And, and he started to think through all of this, and he had to repent in front of his congregation, as embarrassing that was, and he had to say, I'm not living like Jesus. In that moment, I should have asked myself, what would Jesus do? If he was opening this door, what would Jesus do based on Jesus' relationship with his father, based on the love he had for his father? How would that change Jesus' life and call him to interact in that situation differently? And that one sermon turned into a series on what would Jesus do? If we are really connecting with God, if we are really loving God, that should change our lives so that our lives look like Jesus. What would Jesus do? And that series turned into a message that, that started to resonate and, and change the town. And, and it eventually became the WWJD bracelets that, that challenge us even today as we're reading this, that when we are called to love God, we are called to follow in Jesus's example. We are supposed to love God like Jesus, to find abundant life in Jesus, to follow him in the way he loved God, to connect with our Father the way Jesus did, to allow our hearts to be transformed into the ways that Jesus was, was, was living his life, and to follow in that example. That is when we start to find abundant life. We were made on purpose to be in a relationship with our Father in the same way that Jesus was in a relationship with his Father. And that should change us. Here's the thing. If, if we're going to ask ourselves, are we loving God like Jesus? Then that should change us and that should open up this door that we realize that that is the purpose that we were made, but that we were also made for a purpose. We weren't made just to be in a love relationship with God. That relationship should change us and call us to something. And that is the for a purpose that we were made. We were made on purpose to be in a love relationship with Jesus, finding abundant life in him, but we were also made for a purpose. And that purpose for which we were made was to lead others into an abundant life with Jesus. Going back to this, like we were made to be in the hands of a master craftsman. We were made to be in that relationship. 
But that relationship means that if we're loving God the way Jesus loved God, if we're loving him like God, then he wants us to love people the way God loved people, the way Jesus loved people. We were made on purpose. We were made for a purpose. So when we look at this and we start asking ourselves, what does that look like? When we look at the relationship that Jesus had with his disciples, we see something amazing happen in the year and a half to two years that Jesus was walking with them. And they were watching him and they were learning to love God the way Jesus loved God. They were allowing their hearts to shift and to change, to be molded into the hearts of Jesus. And around two years, a year and a half to two years, Jesus started to talk to the disciples a little different. And he was telling them, I don't want you to become apathetic. I don't want you to become apathetic in a Bible study after Bible study after Bible study. We're not, we're not just going to sit around studying the Word of God all day. That's a lot of what they did in the first year and a half. But then Jesus kind of makes a turn. And he says, I, I don't want you just to see how good our Father is and how good it is to be in a relationship with Him. I don't want you just to be transformed and, and allow your heart just to share my heart. There's something more. Maturity in me is more than just loving God, being in a relationship with him and being like me. Maturity comes when you start to actually live your life like me. And that's when he told his disciples, I don't want you just to follow me. I want you to learn how to fish for men. I want you to learn how to turn around and start serving other people, loving other people the same way you've seen me love people for the last year and a half. I want you to step in it, and I want you to love people like me in the example that I have set. So Jesus started taking his disciples on mission trips and equipping them and training them and teaching them to do it, and that's where we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is about to send them out on one of the scariest mission trips because he's about to send them out to go heal people on their own, to go teach people on their own, to go love people like him without Jesus by their side. And you can imagine how scared and terrified those disciples were. Listen to what Jesus says and listen to how he encourages them in Matthew chapter 10. He says this, as, as he's sending them out and they're brainstorming, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? How am I going to love people the way Jesus loved people? How am I going to serve people the way Jesus served people? Listen to what Jesus said. Do not be anxious. You can feel that. Jesus saw in their eyes the anxiety. He said, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. So again, Jesus was looking at his disciples, and I'm sure several of them were panic-stricken. De like eyes, deers, like in headlights, like just, Jesus, what are we going to do? What are we going to say? And I'm sure there was, there was some disciples that were like, all right, half of them can go out, but Jesus, we want to stay with you, and, and we want to do wild at heart with you. John, like this, this incredible book was written. We want to do a Bible study with you. We want to sit in a room. We just want to hear what you would have to say about how we're supposed to live our lives. Can we just do one more Bible study? And Jesus would look at them and say, no, I, I don't want you to be stuck in an apathetic life of Bible study. It's time to live it out. Don't be apathetic. Go and do what I've called you to do. Live my heart out with the way you love and serve people. He would look at some of the other disciples that are kind of standing on the corner. If he saw John kind of like cowering behind a rock, making sure that Jesus overlooks them, Jesus would see him and say, John, why aren't you going out? And John would maybe say, like, I'm, I'm paralyzed, Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm praying, and I want to make sure that I'm going to go talk to the exact right person and say the exact right words that you have for me. I want to make sure I don't miss the mark. A lot of times we get paralyzed because we, we were looking for this specific purpose that Jesus is calling us to, and, and Jesus is encouraging him, no, I just want you to go love people. Go, go be who you are. Go do what I've called you to do. And as you're doing that, I will lead you to whatever specific purpose. But the, the worst thing that could happen is you're going to say the right thing to the wrong person, which is a good problem. And it's an okay problem. You, you can't mess this up in the equity of God. When Jesus sent them out, he sent them out with this broad purpose saying, go and love people. Go and serve people. Think about how I've done it in the past and just go be me to these people. 
And as John, just like Peter would think through it, this is what John would encourage us with. These are his words in 1 John 2, 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So, so John is saying, if we abide in him, if we are resting in our purpose, that we are created to be in a relationship with Jesus, and we are resting in that Bible study, if you will, and if our hearts are being transformed to be like Jesus, if we're abiding in him, then we should go and walk as Jesus walked. We should go and love people like Jesus. We should go serve people like Jesus. We should not be apathetic and, and restrained to our Bible study. We should be freed from that to live it out, to take it out into the real world and apply it in real ways. We don't need to be paralyzed and scared. We need to listen to the Spirit. We need to listen to our Father, give us words, give us actions, give us direction as we go out and live our faith out, as we live like Jesus, as we love like Jesus. We find this, this definition of maturity starting to grow when we find that we are called to love God like Jesus, to connect with him, to, to come and see how good he is, to follow Jesus, to allow our hearts to change, and then to love people like Jesus. And we start to see that we can love people in the same way. We can serve people in the same way. We, we, we turn around. We connect with each other in small groups. We, we look at the world, and we look for ways that Jesus is giving us words and actions to love people out in the world and allow our faith to be demonstrated and lived out. That's what it starts to mean to, to be a mature Christian. It's not about how much you know. It's about how much you live and love like Jesus. So when you think about your life, do you love God like Jesus loved God? Do you love people like Jesus loved people? That's a much more challenging and robust definition of what it means to love God and love people. And we see that it is a definition of maturity, that we should grow in our relationship with Jesus, with God, and that should lead to action, and our lives should start to look like Jesus. And that leads us to this last phrase that we use for us to live generously like Jesus. And you may think, well, what does that mean? I don't really see Jesus giving away all of his money. Jesus did talk about giving money away and, and what you do and how you steward your money. But that's just part of what it means to live generously, to, to not just tithe, but to, to give above and beyond uh, to, to, to things in the, in the church and into the community and to, to people in need. It's, it's not just about your financial resources. That's a part of generosity. And that trains our hearts to be generous in the ultimate way that he's called us to. Uh, there's other ways that we're not, uh, generous, not just giving our, our money, but giving our time and, and giving our resources. And, and this is one of the reasons why I love being a part of Cascade, because we do model this so well that this is one layer of generosity. And I've just got to brag on you real quick in, in how we have recently lived generously as a church the way Jesus would. Uh, just a little while ago, the, the school systems contacted us and said, we have a need. So first of all, I love the fact that the schools feel comfortable reaching out to us and say, can you help with something? So they asked us, can you help provide something? Our children that are now coming back to school, they need water bottles because they can't drink out of the water fountains. They can't drink out of things that we provide them. They have to bring their own water bottles and not every child has a water bottle. So Kimberly Clem, who is doing an amazing job helping us connect with the community and live generous lives towards the community. Uh, she posted on our Facebook page, The Generosity Project, that there was a need. And instead of supplying the 50 that they asked for, we supplied 177 water bottles. So we weren't able to just provide a need for Frank Wagner, but we were able to provide for three additional schools as well as that. That's amazing generosity that you have lived out. You have loved people and you've lived generously in a way that Jesus would call us to. And if you're not familiar with the Generosity Project, that's kind of our, our training ground for what it looks like to really live a generous life. How we can start practicing with our finances, with our time, with our resources, how we can be aware of needs that are in our community and how we can step in and live generously the way Jesus lived generously. And when we practice that, practice living generously in these ways, we, we start getting closer to what Jesus actually called us to do with a truly generous life. 
So, so listen to this. Th this is the definition of spiritual maturity, not just that we come and see who God is, that we grow in our personal relationship with him, that we're transformed to look like Jesus, that we start loving people the way Jesus did. But, but maturity, full maturity, looks like when we are generous the way Jesus is generous. And how would Jesus define? What was the generosity that Jesus was really getting to? When John chapter 20 and Matthew here, 28, this is after Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead. This was some of the last words that Jesus gave his disciples. At the end of his life, Jesus had been walking with them for three years, watching them grow in their ability to connect with God, watching them grow in their ability to love people. And now he was giving them the final definition of what maturity is really going to look like. And he said this in John chapter 20, he said, just as the way God sent me into the world, I am sending you in the exact same way. I'm asking you to do the exact same thing. When you think about my life, my full life, this is what I'm calling you to do. And in Matthew 28, he, he clearly lays it out with verses 19 to 20. He said, go and make disciples among all nations. Go and make disciples not just lead them to Christ, not just teach them how to live out the love of Jesus, but all the way to full maturity, make disciples among all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them, helping them stand strong and saying, I'm making a convicting stand in front of the whole world, saying, I'm giving my life to Christ. And then what does Jesus say next? Don't stop at just baptizing them. You have more responsibility. A mature life will do more than just baptize someone. A mature person in Jesus Christ will teach that person how to obey every command that I've given them. A, a mature believer, a mature disciple will not only lead someone to Christ, not only baptize someone to Christ, but will walk with them in their spiritual life and make that person into a disciple and teach them how to go out and lead others to Christ and to, to baptize other people and to lead other people into living the life of a disciple. This is why that we the definition of maturity in our church is this, that, that, that every Christian is a disciple and every disciple is a disciple maker, someone who connects and, and loves God with all their heart, all their soul, and all their mind, that loves people the way Jesus loved people and lives generously to the point that they bear fruit, that they reproduce spiritually and make a disciple in someone else. That's what a mature Christian should do. So as we think about that, as we think about the calling that Jesus had, and we hear John's words and Peter's words that says, whoever abides in him should live the same life that Jesus lived. The full scope of maturity, the fullness, the full abundant life should rep be represented in their lives. How does that change the way we live our lives? Do we love God like Jesus? Do we love people like Jesus? Do we live generously like Jesus? When, when this is the definition of what a mature Christian looks like, how many people look around and say, you know what, I've never led anyone to Jesus. Jesus is calling you. He's, he's saying there's room to grow. How many people look around and say, I've never made a disciple. I've never walked with someone intentionally in their faith and, and helped them become a disciple. Jesus is calling us. There's more to a mature life than the next Bethmore Bible study. There's more than that. Jesus is calling you not only to live it out in your lives, but he's calling you to take someone else through that study. He's calling you to take a new believer and teach them how to love God like Jesus, to teach them how to love people like Jesus, to teach them how to live generously the way Jesus lived. Do you hear this? this just adding these two words, like Jesus, makes L3 so much more challenging. And I, I love looking around, and, and right now as we are re-entering into doing ministry, as we're getting to a point where we can do more ministry with youth and with young adults and with men and women, th this is the thing that we're talking through as a staff. How do we build our ministries around L3 like Jesus? So I said at the beginning, like the, the, the example that we set with the pastor in Topeka, Kansas, with with Charles Sheldon. He, he preached a sermon on what would Jesus do. And, and he started to live that out 
himself. He started to teach his congregation. He started to make disciples in his congregation to teach them to ask what would Jesus do in their lives. He started investing in others. And that sermon, like I said, became a series which became a movement. And that was back in 97, but it wasn't 1997. It was 1897. Over a hundred years ago, one man found this heart to love God like Jesus, to love people like Jesus, and to live generously like Jesus, to, to make disciples the way Jesus did. And, and he did it by asking people, what would Jesus do? And the way we're calling you to do that, that was over a hundred years ago. And in the same spirit, to, to look at your spiritual life, to look at L3 and just add these two words. What does it mean to love God like Jesus, to love people like Jesus, and to live generously like Jesus? We, we see this happening in the ministries at our church. If you look at the SALT ministry, the young adults, they are modeling this so well. You, you look at this group of people that are, that are growing, but they're not just growing to have another Bible study or another worship session. They are meeting together. 40 and 50 young adults are coming together, reading the Word together, connecting with their Father like Jesus, growing their understanding of the Word of God like Jesus and being challenged to leave and love people like Jesus. And over and over again, every week, we're, we're finding out new ways that, that this young adult ministry is going out and serving our community, whether it's cutting down trees or cleaning up yards or meeting people in the midst of whatever need. When a need is brought to the SALT ministry, they jump on it because they know if Jesus was there, what would Jesus do? Jesus would step into the need. He would open the door, see the homeless man, and be called to do something about it. The salt ministry doesn't even stop with that. Like, they turn around, and, and not only are they loving people well, but they're turning around and making disciples well. So many of the leaders that are in the youth ministry right now come from salt, and they're, they're saying, I want to step into this ministry so that I can make a disciple. Salt is killing it right now. Our youth ministry has, has been growing this for the past seven years of how to make their ministry like that, men's ministry, women's ministry. We want all of our ministries to represent Jesus in this way. Do we L3 like Jesus? And as you're listening to this sermon, that's the question I want to leave you with. Do you love God like Jesus? Do you love people like Jesus? Do you live generously like Jesus? We're going to be unpacking that over the next two months. What does it look like to add these two words to our life, like Jesus? To be a tool that we know we were created on purpose, to be in a love relationship with our Heavenly Father like Jesus was. To rest in that relationship. We are God's workmanship created in Christ for good works. Not just to rest in a relationship with Him, but to be used by Him to love people and live generously. Don't be a misplaced tool. Don't find yourself just caught on a shelf. Rest in your relationship with Jesus and step into the purpose, the abundant life that he has called you to. As we wrap things up and as, as we go into this time of communion, the reason why we do this is because we want to be like Jesus. So as we take these elements, as, as, we, as we look at them and we realize that Jesus' body was broken, just like Peter says in chapter 2, that he suffered, he laid himself down for us, and in the same way that Jesus was broken, we are called to be broken. So Jesus right now, in this holy moment, first, we want to thank you for suffering for us. Jesus, you stepped out of the comforts of heaven into the restraints of humanity. Jesus says in Philippians chapter 2 that you grew in obedience, that you learned an obedient life to God. You learned to live life as a human, to suffer for us, to leave us an example of how we can live our life and how we can be broken for others. Jesus, we thank you for what you have done to us. And Jesus, I 
ask that you work in our hearts to call us and to lead us into our brokenness for others. Jesus, as we hold this cup, this little cup of, of juice that symbolizes your blood, Jesus, we, we hold this and we recognize that you poured yourself out, that it is your blood that opened the door for us to be forgiven. It is through your forgiveness that we receive your redemption, that you lay your perfection on us. Now, Jesus, God, your Father, sees us in your righteousness because of your blood. You led us into abundant life through the forgiveness of your blood. So Jesus, as we thank you for what you've done for us, can we recognize that we are called to live the same example out, that we are supposed to lead others into this abundant life, that we are supposed to take your forgiveness into the world and allow that forgiveness to be placed on other people, to lead other people to Christ and to help them to grow in their understanding of their righteousness, their worth, their value in your kingdom. Jesus, as we take this and we thank you for the work you've done in our life, may we realize that your suffering set an example for us to live to be broken for others, and to lead others into this forgiveness that you've given us. And whenever we take communion, we, we always want to remind you not only to, to love God and to love people, but to live generously. Uh, back, back when we were meeting together, we would pass the plates and we would take up an offering specific to the community care. Uh, so I just want to encourage you, on top of what you're, you're giving to the church, on top of your tithe today, can you remember the generosity that Jesus is calling us to? You can open up the, the app. You can, uh, you can, very similarly, in the same way that you tithe, you can designate your money to be given directly to community care and go towards the things that, that need to help Monroe see Jesus Christ, to continue to set the example of what it looks like for a church to love the community like Jesus, which you've done so well. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be a part of Cascade Community Church, to be a part of a church that is already growing in its ability to love God like Jesus, to love people like Jesus, and to live generously like Jesus. I am so excited for what Jesus has in front of us because we are already stepping into what he's called us to, and it is gonna be amazing to see what Jesus continues to do as we grow in our ability to take these two words into our week. This week, can you L3 like Jesus? We'll see you next week. From the moment that I rise To the one who rescued me And brought me life Praise the way to at the dawn oh, Praise the way to in the night oh, With the heavens I will sing And lift you high
thank you for joining us today. It's been great to worship with you all and read from the Word as well. If you call Cascade your home and you would like to give generously here, uh, then you can text Cascade to 77977. And uh, if you're watching us online and, and you would like to hit the like button and subscribe and possibly share this video for others in your community to see as well, we would greatly appreciate that. And we'll see you next week.